Our next speaker is the Vice President and Wild Horse Specialist for the Wild Horse Freedom Federation, Debbie Coffey. She also does a weekly radio show about wild horses and burrows. And I have a great deal of respect for people who do investigations because they're always putting themselves on the line. Having done a few myself and knowing about some of the great investigations that the organizations represented here have done, it's really something that is so necessary because a lot of the information that we have is thanks to people who put themselves on the line and do these investigations. So we're very, very proud and privileged to welcome Debbie Coffey. Yeah, I, watching. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to thank Susan Wagner, Karen Wagner, Equine Advocates, and all of the volunteers who put together so much hard work for this event. It's yeah. very impressive. Um, I'm very honored to be here. Um, and thank you all of you for coming and being interested and wanting to learn. Uh, Wild Horse Freedom Federation is an all-volunteer 501c3 charitable organization. And our president, R.T. Fitch, couldn't be here. He's out of the country. Uh, but my fellow board member, Terry Fitch, is here. Whoops. <laughs> a little nervous. Uh, Terry Fitch is here. And um, uh, we also have uh, put on a weekly, uh, sometimes weekly radio show. What's he called? Wild Horse and Borough Radio. And we've had John Holland on. Ginger's been on several times. Victoria McCullough was gracious enough to come on when we got the good news about the defunding language to let everybody know these shows are archived and they're an educational outreach that people can uh, listen to. Um, today we're going to talk about the Bureau of Land Management, mismanagement of our <coughs> wild horses and girls. This is a photograph of Carol Walker, who's our director of field, field documentation to, at the Rock Springs. Oh. This is, uh, I'm talking about the Bureau of Land Management, mismanagement of the wild horses and burrows. This is a photo that Carol Walker took uh, at the Rock Springs, Wyoming corrals. Uh, and, and the issue was brought up about shelter. This is the winter. Uh, in the summer, the Bureau of Land Management does helicopter roundups when it's 100 degrees or something and runs the horses in the heat. Um, the BLM claims there are 40,605 wild horses and burros roaming on BLM-managed rangelands in 10 western states. They claim the horses and burros have virtually no natural predators and that their herd sizes double every four years. Well, I'm going to give you a quick background on this. When Congress passed the Wild Free Roaming of Burros Act in 1971, uh, there were 53.8 million, whoops, um, or 53.8 million acres known as herd areas. In what seems to be one of the many erosions of Congress's initial intent of this act that stated that wild horses and burros were to be considered in areas where presently found as an integral part of the natural system of public lands, the BLM created 179 subsets of these original herd areas and called them herd management areas that com comprise of only 31.6 million acres. So we lost 22.2 um, million acres to the wild horses right there. There were 339 herd areas in 1971, but as of 2011, there were only 165 herd management areas left. The BLM still claims there's 179 herd management areas, but 14 of these have been zeroed out. There are no wild horses on them. Herd management areas often contain fenced off areas for livestock grazing, so wild horses can't get to water sources, they get less desirable forage, they often can't intermingle with other herds, which deprives the wild horse herds of genetic variability. This lack of genetic variability leads to inbreeding, deformed foals, and physical defects, and threatens the viability of herds. Uh, Dr. Gus Cawthron, who's an equine geneticist with Texas A&M, stated that wild horse herds need to be 100 or 120 horses of uh, breeding age adults to remain viable. Now I know in the priors, Jerry Tillett told me a lot of times the BLM count included foals. 
2011, out of 181 herds left <coughs> on 165 herd management areas, only 53 wild horse herds had over 100 horses. Only 11 wild burrow herds had over 100. So, uh, only 64 herds out of 181 herds were viable in 2011. Um, let's see. The BLM hired Dr. Cothran to do genetic analysis of some of the herds. He hasn't done it. It hasn't been done on all of them. After the BLM sent DNA samples to Dr. Gus Cothran, on occasion it took one to three years for his genetic analysis to be issued. The BLM rarely includes the information from Dr. Cothran's genetic analysis for the public in environmental assessment when it tries to justify rounding up the wild horses. Um, when I looked at these, I noticed one time on the priors there were two reports for the same date same month, same day. And I thought, oh, they must have accidentally included the same two things in my FOIA request. But I actually looked through them, and I found that the wording was changed in one of them at the end, with the recommendation and, you know. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, without viable herds, the BLM has left wild horses and burrows they are supposed to protect on the brink of extinction. So you wonder, how does the BLM count the wild horses? Well, they can't prove their numbers. The BLM doesn't take many photos on, or videos on population inventory flights where they count the four horses. And the raw data, uh, that means the notes the people take that are on the plane or afterwards, gets filtered through what seems to be a flawed population modeling and comes up with exaggerated high numbers. As an example, Kathleen Gregg, a wild horse advocate and a researcher, uh, filed the Freedom of Information Act request for the of data, pictures, and handwritten notes from the BLM's Eagle Lake Field Office, and that's in northeastern California, from their aerial wild horse population, uh, wild horse and burrow census flight done on April 9th through 12th, 2013. And this was the Twin Peaks, Coppersmith, Buckhorn herd management areas. Uh, on this fixed wing airplane, there were four BLM employees, two observers and two photographers. Uh, during this four days, they took 134 photos. Now, this is about 30 photos a day. Jeff took more pictures at Donna's last night. Uh, of these in these 134 photographs, they only documented 468 horses. And what was the BLM's count? One written count, 1,750 horses. Now, the wild horse and burrow advocates are kind of tired of this, so there have been independent flyovers where we have a scientific grid, they go out and count, they had a GoPro camera on the plane, they took a bunch of pictures. Uh, they're hardly finding, they're, they're not finding 1,750 horses in this area. Um, I think uh, that the BLM should be required to photograph and video each wild horse and burrow counted on inventory flights using and using GPS and a time date stamp and to only use the count they can actually verify or prove. And another thing the BLM use, routinely uses the assumption that wild horses and burrow herds an, increase annually at an average rate of 20%. We've done an independent review of available scientific literature <coughs> combined with an analysis of BLM data for 5,859 wild horses and found that only approximately 50% of the foals survived to the age of one year which indicates only a 10% population growth rate based on yearling survival rates. The data analysis from this independent review is in line with an analysis from the National Academy of, of Science, National Wild and Free Roaming Horse and Burrow Report of 1982, which cited biases in BLM census data and concluded annual rates of increase of 10% or less. The BLM cannot prove there is an overpopulation or an excess of wild horses in burrows. On the BLM's uh, website, it states that 
ecosystems of public rangelands are not able to withstand the impact from overpopulated herds, which include soil erosion, sedimentation of streams, and damage to wildlife habitat. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a few of these environmental assessments. Uh, one of them, in uh, the 2011 environmental assessment for the Rock Springs Field Office of Wyoming, uh, they're only allowing whoops, let me see, uh, 69 horses on 611,113 acres. That's one horse every 8,711 acres. <laughs> and then down here, the herd management area right below, which is called White Mountain, only 205 or 300 horses there uh, on 236, 921 acres of public land. That's only one horse every 1,155 acres. And this is common. I'm seeing this in a lot of, this type of, these type of numbers in a lot of environmental assessments. Well, so this is the map the BLM showed you in the environmental assessment. What they didn't show you, what were the other uses? This is a map of the oil and gas lease sales in that area. So all the red are the oil and gas lease sales. The green shows the only areas that are left to the wild horses. And that doesn't even count the cattle, the livestock grazing, that if you overlay that, there's livestock grazing. Um, the Wild Free Roaming Wild Horse and Burrow Act of 1971 originally stated that areas where the wild horses and burrows freely roamed were be, to be devoted principally, but not necessarily exclusively, to their welfare. Does it look to you as if this HMA has been principally devoted to the wild horses? Uh, does leaving only 69 horses, a non-viable herd, uh, sound like it benefits their welfare? And I've actually, I did, when I saw this, this is in Wyoming, when I saw this, I decided to do a map of all the herd management areas in Wyoming. And when the Bureau of Land Management, when they do these oil, their district does an oil and gas lease sale yearly, they can pick any land they want. And what I was noticing, there's sure a lot of areas in Wyoming, it seems half of the herd management areas within the areas are, are going for oil and gas. And then I'll see not so many areas outside. And a lot of times, I don't know if you know, that the oil companies actually go and tell the BLM where they want, where, if they want land in certain places. Um, in 2010, there was an environmental assessment to round up horses in northeastern Nevada in the Antelope Valley complex, leaving only, again, 471 to 788 horses on over a million and a third, 766 acres of public land. Even with the most horses, 788, that's only one horse every 1,658 acres. The BLM's environmental assessment stated that they needed to round up these wild horses to prevent unnecessary or undue degradation of the public lands and to protect rainland resources from deterioration associated with the excess populations of wild horses within the HMAs. That same year, in, in the... Elko District, they gave it a finding of no significant impact to the Rossi mine expansion, even though the EA noted uh, the lowering of the water table at the Rossi mine and the decreased production of existing wells indicates that the groundwater table in the vicinity of the mine is declining. Over and over in the environmental assessments, I see photos of a pen next to a uh, hoof print or a dime next to some blades of grass while the BLM exaggerates the damage wild horses do to the range as their excuse to remove them all. Over and over again in EAs for mining, no matter how many billions of gallons of water they use, no matter how many acres of disturbance they cause, the BLM approves them with a finding of no significant impact. Um, I'm still looking at mining EAs, hoping to see a picture of a dime or a pen next to a pit lake. Um, <laughs> In 2010, the Bureau of Land Management gave the green light to the expansion of a mining project within the Triple B herd management area in Nevada. Even with the information in the EA that there was mercury in the watershed and higher levels of arsenic in the water. Um, and right here where the mine was, this, and, and this was in the EA for the mine. It was like on the last page, I flipped through like 300 and some pages, and then I see it's the Bald Mountain Mine and as mercury deposits 
contaminating the watershed or something like that. And I said, right where the mine is. So the BLM looks at this and they know, I mean, common sense, the mine caused this, so you're going to expand it. And, and yet you're worried about the wild horses that drink 15 gallons of water a day and, you know, have a little trail somewhere. Um, the BLM would show a photo of a horse trail, citing the need to remove the wild horses, yet approve wide pipelines over many miles. Although the Federal Land, land Management Policy Act stated that the public land decisions were not to be based on monetary gain, but what was best for present and future generations, you can see that the BLM's decision making sure seems to be based on uses that bring in lots of money. And. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about roundups now. Um, the next step. The BLM, uh, back in Oregon, the, I, I went to some roundups in Oregon and there was a new contractor there. It was called Sunjay. And I was there one of the first few days of the roundup. And we were on a hill and there was a trap site and a hill. Well, this helicopter pilot came in and I swear he was inches from hitting that hill and crashing that helicopter. Killing him, not only himself and a passenger, but probably, you know, uh, harming her, horses and people below. And um, so a lot of roundups by this Sunjay livestock have been controversial. Uh, Sunjay is owned by Jody Holmes and her husband John Holmes. Jody Holmes is an ex-BLM employee. She was a wild horse and burrow specialist. And in a little over their first two years, the BLM paid them over five and a half million dollars. In a Freedom of Information Act response that included their resumes, because I was wanted to find out what their experience was, mm -hmm. the crew of the Bureau of the Land Management Contractor, Sanjay, uh, they hired a subcontractor that was grossly underqualified. After receiving complaints, the BLM started an internal investigation in January 2011 and issued a report in February stating, the gathered contract solicitation requires that all proposals demonstrate a minimum of 1,500 hours of flying experience in similar projects to, for the proposed primary and secondary helicopter pilots. To be considered for a contract award, the contractor needs an overall experience of humanely capturing a minimum of 3,000 wild horses and burros while using helicopter drive <laughs> trapping. The contractor and proposed key personnel needed this overall experience in similar projects during the time from 2007 to present. Well, then we have helicopter pilot Josh Hellier. Hellier's resume listed his ACETA, that's A-C-E-T-A, which stands for Aerial Captive Eradication and Tagging of Animals Experience as Wyoming Game and Fish Survey, Elk, Deer, Bighorn, Sheep, Raptors, and Sage Grouse, 2006 to present. And then there was one wild horse roundup with Rick Harmon, 300 head, 2009. So his total flight time was 310 hours. That's 1,190 sh hours shy of the required 1,500 hours of flying experience. Also, does surveying sage grouse sound similar <laughs> to rounding up wild horses to you? <laughs> um, there, were, there have been a lot of people that have gone and observed roundups. I first met Terry and RT at the Twin Peaks roundups. Um, when NBC News recently did that story of Lisa Myers and she questioned Jane Goyafoyle and, and she showed her pictures from roundups of the helicopter skids hitting the burrows, yeah. um, Joan said, oh, these are isolated incidents or something like that. Uh, they're not isolated incidents. I think Joan's been to one roundup maybe and they were probably really careful because she was there as they are when, when the New York Times or any big news organizations or congressional representatives send somebody to go look. Uh, they're on their best behavior, <clears throat> and even though the BLM wouldn't allow you or I in one of their vehicles, they bring these reporters mm -hmm. out to the sites. They don't let them near the advocates. They take them right down to the tra trap site, so they're giving them their PR spin the whole time. Um, after much publicity about what's going on at these roundups, the BLM found a way out of it. There, I was, there's, there was a First Amendment rights case in federal court about our right to observe the roundups and be on public lands. I was, I was a witness in that case. I had some of my FOIA documented um, papers were in that case. Uh, photographs I took were in that case. But the BLM found a way around it. They went to bait trapping. And bait trapping's great because it's done on horseback. 
so now, and I know um, Ginger had great luck with bait trapping in her area. Um, it turned out really well. But I'm worried about all the other areas. They don't tell you when they're going to do it, where they're going to do it. They, they close off large areas of roads to public lands. And basically, they get a big fat check. And uh, one of the, the advocate, there's one advocate that has filed. They're supposed to be taking photographs. They're not taking photographs. Um, they don't even even their invoices that they get paid for don't say when or where they have done these roundups. So again, there's no accountability from an agency that claims to be very transparent. Uh -huh. After BLM wild horses are rounded up, they're separated. Stallions are separated from their mares and foals. The horses are kept in temporary holding pens at the site until they are trucked to short-term holding facilities. There, the adults are processed. They're giving freeze mark numbers, which are alphanumeric symbols on the left side of their neck. And the one really important thing in all of this, and this is true at all of the holding facilities, the BLM has not kept a written count or records of the foals. I noticed this. I was on a tour at one of the places, and I asked uh, Dean Bolstad, who was then uh, the deputy chief, division chief of the Wild Horse and Burrow Program, uh, how many holes? Folds do you have here? He goes, oh, about 50-something. I said, isn't that like being sort of pregnant? <laughs> but they, they don't keep a record of them. So who knows what happens to those foals? Do they give them away for rodeo bucking stock? Do they keep them for themselves? Uh, is somebody making a little money on the side selling foals? Uh, we don't know what happens to the foals. Um, there are currently 25 short-term holding facilities. Seven of these are prisons. Horses that aren't adopted out of these short-term holding facilities, where they can stay for a couple of years, um, supposedly live out their lives happily grazing in long-term holding pastures. Um, long-term holding consists of either all geldings or all mares. There are no family bands. The BLM currently has 48,194 horses and burros warehoused in short-term holding and long-term holding pastures. Um, in talking about short-term holding, uh, this is BLM's Palomino Valley facility in Sparks, Nevada, Nevada, just north of Reno. Uh, and it seemed to be drastically underreporting the actual number of horses and burros that died under its care from 2010 to 2012. Uh, animals, Angels and I actually happened to be talking, and we comp I said, oh, I have these records from a FOIA, and they go, oh, well, we have these records. So we put them together. Um, so the Nevada Bureau of Land Management had an ongoing contract with a rendering plant, Nevada Byproducts, doing business as Reno Rendering, to process the horses and burros from the Palomino Valley Holding Facility. In the contract specifications, the Nevada BLM estimated approximately 200 adults and 100 foals would need to be sent for rendering each year. The Animals Angel's records uh, that they obtained were for all records of deceased horses and burros sent from the BLM holy facility to the rendering plant from January 1st, 2010 through May 31st, 2012. I received a FOIA of the official Palomino Valley Mortality Detail Report, which noted that only 241 horses and burros died at the Palomino Valley and 50 at the Fallon facility. However, Animals Angels records from the rendering plant told a different story. According to the Nevada byproduct invoices for that same time period, a startling 577 dead horses were received from the Palomino Valley facility. This is a shocking difference of 336 animals, uh, 286 if the Nevada byproduct invoice included the Fallon horses, a number too large to ignore. Uh, an inordinate number of foals and colts were among the deceased. Newborns or babies were specifically noticed on several of the rendering plant receipts. A total of 332 foals and colts were included in the rendering plant invoices. In March, 20, March 211 alone, 10 horses and 64 colts died and were shipped to Nevada by products. The disparity in the death rates reported by the BLM seem to indicate many more horses and burros are dying at BLM facilities than they are claiming on their records. Uh, next, I'm going to show you, uh, not far from Palomino Valley, uh, is a, in Fallon, Nevada, is a short-term holding 
a facility called, it's called Indian Lakes Road or Broken Arrow or Fallon. Uh, it's referred to several things. Um, it's, and the BLM placed these, where Palomino Valley, because it's a BLM facility, you can go around and look. They put them on a private property where the public can't go look. Um, I went on some tours there. That they, they were having tours once a week at this facility. They built this house at the top, and supposedly one room contains an office for the BLM. Uh, these were some pictures around there. Now, one of these days, there were a lot of foals blowing in there. Notice the wind. Now, this person right here is Dean Bolstad. He's the then he was then the um, deputy chief, division chief for the Wild Horse and Burrow Program. So you'd think he probably noticed the wind since he was walking in it. Another one of our advocates thought, gee, the hay's there. What's it like in the hay? And as she walked through, clouds were just billowing up of sand that had gotten in the hay. Um, so the BLM was giving weekly tours, but people were seeing what was happening after they were gelding them. Uh, there seemed to be horses in pain. We were noticing sores on the horses, or if, you know, they were where they're getting strangles. So people were writing about this in their blogs. So basically, and suddenly, after their weekly tours, uh, the BLM, uh, in May 28, 2010, announced that the final public tour, stating that Indian Lakes is a privately owned and operated facility, like this was an accident, was never intended as a public facility, and isn't staffed to serve the public. As a result, staff from other offices have been taken away from priority work, and unplanned costs have been incurred. So, I filed the Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, and by the way, I've, I've, I've been to 30 roundups, I've been to many BLM holding facilities, but mostly I've been filing, following a paper trail. I've filed probably 100 Freedom of Information Act requests by now. So I filed this one, and I received the contract modification for the India Lakes Road facility, dated 3-22-10, and signed by Troy Adams for two-hour public tours to be held once a week from the period of 2010 to 2015. So apparently, five days before this news release, they were having their final tour, and only three days before the email below, a contract was signed for future public tours of the Indian Lakes Road facility for the next five years. So, I also received a copy of an email Dean Bolstad, the Deputy Division Chief, uh, sent to other BLM personnel, which stated, you're gonna love this, we now have a favorable Calico court decision, and we need to seriously consider the toll that these tours are taking on our employees, our resources, and the damage that is being done to BLM's image as a result of these tours. John Neal's and our veter veterinarian's reputability is seriously being compromised by the fallout from the Indian Lakes tours. The impact of stopping the tours pales in comparison to the impact of, to our employees and BLM's image. Widely publicized extreme negative criticisms continue, continue to erode BLM's image. The general public has had ample opportunities to, now remind, these are your horses that were on our public lands, to view the Calico Complex herd horses and Indian Lakes Road Facility and BLM's operations. Nevada BLM supports terminating the tours given headquarters approval. Extreme objection from Elise Gardner and the Cloud Foundation will occur, and they will organize a wave of emails and phone calls to BLM management <laughs> officials and congressmen. <laughs> you got that right. Um, and then I filed a FOIA to find out the extra cost in the list of staff taken away from their priority work, since he mentioned it. Uh, and I received a letter from Paulette Sanford of the Department of Interior, dated October 6, 2010, and was told, there is no itemized list or record of the amount of money spent on the unplanned cost, and there is no list or record of staff who were detailed to the work at India Lakes facility away from their priority work. So, there you go. Um, so, also included in the short-term holding facilities are prisons, like Gunnison Prison in Utah. Um, could you pick a less desirable venue for adoptions than a prison. Uh, you get searched at the prison gate. If you're driving in your car, your car gets searched. Uh, you, and you have a SWAT team watching over you. And you have to make an appointment. So again, the horses are on private property and kept out of view of the American public. Um, and also, just think about it. The BLM has allowed felons to take care of 
of our wild horses. Uh, at Gunnison Prison, I received, I asked for the mortality reports in a FOIA request and found many deaths that said the cause was intestines came out, intestines came out, intestines came out, intestines came out. Well, when the BLM gelled stallions, and they gelled all the horses they capture, they even gelled the crypt orchids, which is a little bit more, uh, they have undescended testicles, it's a little more complicated. And it seems that many wild horses have died not only from complications of gelding, but also the crypt orchid surgery. And uh, when I went to speak at the National Academy of Science meeting, I asked, why do you have to geld them if they're going to same-sex uh, pastures for the rest of their lives? Maybe they could just geld them before they're going to be adopted or something. But anyhow, the American Association of Equine Practitioners has stated that post-surgical complications from cryptorchid, cryptorchid surgery can occur but are rare. So why do we have so many deaths from cryptorchid surgery at Gunnison Prison? And actually, I was at another meeting, um, and uh, Dr. David Thane, I talked with Dr. David Thane and Erwin Liu, and after I showed this to the NAS, they came out and they said, that never should have happened. And I said, well, it is happening. So we also have um, long-term holding, uh, about 22, uh, 22, around 22 long-term holding pastures, where supposedly the wild horses are grazing peacefully and having a good time. One of the long-term holding pastures is called Pahuska. That's the name of the town in Oklahoma. And the contractor is Lad Drummond, who's the husband of Reed Drummond, the Cooking Network's pioneer woman, and a writer. And the promo for the Pioneer Woman Cooking Show includes pictures of the wild horses running. So it seems they're being exploited for commercial use. Every 4th of July, the Drummonds have a big 4th of July party. And they also have a big fireworks show. Now, there's also two other long-term holding pastures near there, so they're in real, like, five miles or six miles or something. Um, and Reed Drummond has posted photos of fireworks bursting in the sky with descriptions like kaplow and kaboom. She sewed photos of a bunch of empty boxes on, on the cement thing where they light the fireworks. And when you looked at the boxes, one was called One Bad Mother, and one was called Bombshell. And I'm thinking, how good this, could this be for the wild horses, you know? Um, uh, and the BLM gave tours of, gives tours of long-term holding maybe once a year. They stick people on some buses and, you know, they go to two or three of them that might be close together. So, and another one of their plans is for eco-sanctuaries. The problem was with, with eco-sanctuaries, these are all same-sex, non-reproducing herds on eco-sanctuaries. They're not family bands. And uh, next I'm going to talk about the BLM selling wild horses to slaughter. On the BLM's website, on their myths and facts page, which I have found when I've looked at it, what they claim to be myths are actually facts, and then their answers are usually the myths. Uh, myth, no myth number two was the BLM is selling, selling or sending wild horses to slaughter. Fact. This is what they write. This charge is absolutely false. The Department of the Interior and the Bureau of Land Management care deeply about the well-being of the horses, both on and off the range. And the BLM does not and has not sold or sent wild horses or burros to slaughter. Yet, in records I received from a Freedom of Information Act request, uh, there was a, an email on July 31st, 2008, and this is after slaughter houses were closed here in the United States, uh, from Sally Spencer, who's BLM Wild Horse and Burrow Marketing Specialist. Uh, she seemed to be offering to sell 10,000 wild horses from long-term holding to someone in Canada where there are slaughterhouses. Let's see. There's that document. Sally also stated, We recently sold a load of horses to Saskatchewan from a start point close to one of the long-term holding pastures in Kansas. Uh... There was an extra page attached to this that was all blanked out. And usually when the FOIA department, I don't, you probably can't see it here, they'll give you a, like, let's say B5 or something, and supposedly the reason I got a completely redacted page, which didn't include a date, even the words to or from, it was totally blacked out, was because of deliberative process. Well, 
deliberative process is only between like two people in the BLM if they're discussing ideas, or between interagency like the BLM employee and a USDA employee. It does not include third parties. Mm -hmm. So because of that one page, which I'm guessing or wondering if it could be from the person who was offering to buy the 10,000 horses and may have showed if it was from a slaughterhouse, just saying it could be, I don't know because I haven't seen it yet, um, we're going to have to file a lawsuit just to get that one page. Um, so anyhow, that's where that stands. Um, you've probably also read in the papers about Tom Davis buying about 1,700 wild horses and on his BLM uh, application dated January 10th, 2011, Dave, Davis stated that the horses would be put on oil fields and used to graze to keep grass controlled. The BLM is still investigating this. I think it's what, 2014 now, so that's three years. Uh, I hope that they noticed Davis had been buying horses for years prior to his application to buy them. Uh, he'd been buying horses since 2009, and his application was in 2011. Uh, and it seems that Davis has not yet publicly accounted for the whereabout of these horses. Mm -hmm. uh, Wild Horse Freedom Federation received records <coughs> from the South Dakota Brand Board that reveal that in, on 11-8-2008, while under contract uh, with the BLM for a long-term holding pasture, the owner, which was White Horse, the owner of Spur Livestock, sold 70 horses to JS Farms, owned by kill buyer Joe Simon. Uh -huh. 34 of the horses were noted to have BLM tattoos, and the other 36 horses sold were noted to have what looked like BLM Authority sales freeze brands on them. Uh, about a couple months before he sold these horses, BLM bulk, BLM bulk sale logs indicate that that Jim Reeves bought 36 geldings from Canyon City Prison in Colorado. That was on September 9, 2008. He then bought 36 mares from Palomino Valley, uh, September 23, 2008. So again, uh, it says Spur Livestock, JNS Farms, uh, Joe Simon, uh, BLM Tattoos. This, this little mark right here is what the sale authority uh, brand is and so comparing those documents, it doesn't look good for the BLM when they say that they don't have never sold horses to slaughter and would not. Um, just to tie up some loose ends, a disturbing trend I'm seeing now that everyone should be aware of. Every single BLM meeting, uh, a resource advisory councils, the experimental stewardship committee meetings, there's a big push of ranchers coming in and uh, urging the BLM to euthanize all the horses and all holding. Mm -hmm. And it's a really, uh, it scares me because I'm seeing it over and over again. It's becoming a big topic they're all talking about, like, oh, it's costing so much, let's get rid of them. Um, and, and if you don't know, the, these um, advisory committees the BLM has, they appoint them. So they kind of cherry pick who they want. As you know, we've tried to nominate Ginger, RT, many real wild horse and burrow advocates to the National Wild Horse and Burrow Advisory Board, and they won't pick anybody. <laughs> they won't pick them. So these, you know, that's the national one. There's different resource advisory councils in different districts. But each time people apply, the BLM personnel in that office will send in the ones they think would be best, or, no, or note the ones they, they would choose. So, so the advisory councils are stacked. They seem to only use mostly the information that the BLM supplies to them, like, oh, the horses are reproducing 20% on every, you know, they, they don't really, nobody's really doing their own independent studies. And actually on these resource advisory councils, you know, most of the time I know more than they do when I call. Um, I, I found out the one in Northeastern California, I asked a question, I said, have any of you ever read any of Dr. Cawthorn's genetic analysis? And, and they said, no. You know, so um, I, asked, I asked the BLM to please uh, supply that information to their advisory board. Um, and then what ha happens too, uh, the only two reasons BLM can remove wild horses from public lands without doing an environmental assessment, one of them is if the horses are a nuisance, if they've wandered onto private property. And here again, there's a large area of what if, or what if somebody used their ATV to sort of push a few of them in that direction. 
to have the BLM come in and round them up. Um, I mean, I don't have any proof of that, but I'm just saying that it might happen. Uh, but the BLM actually goes in these meetings, and I listened to a uh, meeting, the last, not the last experimental stewardship committee meeting, but the one before that up in northeastern California, and the BLM reminds the ranchers of the loophole that, around, that allows them to round up the wild horses when they're ready to prepare an EA if they're nuisance horses and found on private property. And not only that, uh, the one, in, uh, Amy Dumas, who's the California Wild Horse and Burrow lead, actually said, oh, well, get a copy of so-and-so's letter, and that'll tell you how to write it. Uh, I'm, I'm urging them to, uh, if, if there are nuisance horses, to get photos, the BLM should get photos with GPS and a time-date stamp to prove there were nuisance horses there before they go in. Um, let's see. Oh, and the other thing, at these advisory board committees, they may say they have someone that's like a county commissioner or elected official. Well, it just so happens oftentimes they're a rancher, too. And so that's another way they stack the decks on these things. Um, and, and what's really funny is I was listening to a RAC, a Resource Advisory Council subcommittee meeting in Northern, Northeastern California, and we actually call and say, could you please set up a teleconference line? And so up in Northeastern California, there's about five or ten of us that always listen to all these obscure you know, closed-door meetings, basically, and they're not expecting any outsiders to be listening. Um, and it turned out in one that uh, the BLM's PR person who was attending this RAC subcommittee meeting, uh, he writes up the, he helps them write their recommendations that they didn't give to the RAC, so that was kind of interesting. Uh, one thing I wanted all of you to know uh, is that you know, they always say the horse is going to slaughter or unwanted. Well, there's a horse cloning company called Viagen uh, that's down in Texas, but they also have an office in Canada. And near it is the McLeod Alberta Slaughterhouse. Mm -hmm. And the uh, ovaries and unfertilized eggs from mares being sent to, can to slaughter mm -hmm. are used for cloning new horses. So that's a big thing, you uh, know. I guess if there's any questions. Oh.